Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains Big Chungus. And today, we are going to discuss locomotives that were just that. Some are even still around and are just that. These locomotives are heavy. Really heavy. Like, quite literally the heaviest. I had to dig deep to try to determine, by metric tons, which locomotives in history were the heaviest. Now, I had a couple rules here. When it comes to steam locomotives, I needed to factor in the tender weight, because they kind of can't move without that. I mean, I guess they could. Not for very long very well, but the, the tender's part of the locomotive, so that had to be factored in, and I'm going to dismiss train sets, like the original ICE was something over 800 metric tons, but that's a set with all the passenger cars included. Now, I know that's technically part of the overall train setup, but the actual power units are not nearly that much in terms of metric tons, so I'm gonna disqualify them this would be really dumb otherwise. These are five of the heaviest locomotives ever. The Union Pacific Big Boy. Now, on one hand, everyone knew that was coming. You knew I was going to say this. I even tried to get around it, but I couldn't. The Big Boys do belong on this list, but you're probably like, wait a minute. This is only number five, though. You mean there are heavier locomotives than the Big Boy? And yes, absolutely. Now, the Big Boy is huge, of course, but a lot of what people assume about it isn't quite correct. It is the largest and heaviest steam locomotive currently in operation, but that doesn't mean it was the largest or heaviest ever, necessarily. It wasn't even the most powerful, either. There's a lot of things that the Big Boy was never really number one at, the reason why the Big Boy is so famous and often gets credited with all these things is that, well, as you've noticed, it does appear on the list. It's still here, and it's consistent across the board. It is in the top five for most powerful, the top five for largest, the top five for heaviest. It is consistently up there in terms of steam locomotives, and by weight, in terms of general locomotives overall, yeah, it is one of the heaviest, but by my calculations, and based off of a bunch of different research, cross-checking a bunch of different websites, no seriously, you have no idea what I had to do to figure all this out, because there's a lot of websites that had differing results based off of a wide array of factors that I had to get over. The big boy weighs in at around 548 metric tons. Absolutely enormous, without question. That's also including the fact that it could supply 135,375 pounds of force and 6,290 horsepower. The big boys are well deserving of their fame. They are astonishingly good locomotives. And the fact that we have one running in the form of 4014 is a victory for heritage railway preservation all over the world. But like I said, they aren't the heaviest at all. The Yellowstones. Now, there's a couple of things to consider. First of all, you're probably thinking, wait, I thought you were going to go with the Alleghenies. The Chesapeake and Ohio 2666 Alleghenies. They're heavier, right? That's what I've been told, and you have been lied to over the years. That's a myth that has been repeatedly debunked. And people keep saying it to me, and it drives me nuts every time I see it because it's just wrong. Now, the Alleghenies were close to the big boys, but they weren't quite heavier than them. This has to do with misinformation that's been stated in books about the Alleghenies, but they were re-weighed later, and it was found that while without the tender, they were still just a little bit heavier than the big boys with the tender, which like I said, I have to factor in, their tenders were way lighter than the big boys were, thus making the big boy heavier than the Allegheny. But that isn't the case for the Yellowstones. And that actually might be a bit confusing because the big boys are four 884s, while Yellowstones are only two 884s. They have technically a smaller wheel arrangement, but that doesn't mean they were necessarily lighter than them. And they weren't. 
The Yellowstones had a pretty big tender like the big boys did, and when you factor that in, they weighed about 566 metric tons. They were also capable of supplying 140,093 pounds of force, and had a horsepower rating of 6,250. Those figures, by the way, are based off of the DM and IR Yellowstones. It's true that other railways like Northern Pacific and Southern Pacific had Yellowstones in their roster, but it seems that the Duluth, Misabi, and Iron Rain Yellowstones were the heaviest out of all of them, and if I had to guess, I'd say that's due to their tender weight. DM and IR gave their Yellowstones high-capacity centipede tenders, and they had roller bearings on all the axles. This made their tenders not only capable of carrying a lot more for the locomotive's operation, but also quite a bit heavier. So that probably factored in a lot to making the Yellowstones a little bit heavier than the big boys. But here's where we get into weird stuff, because now that we've covered both the heaviest articulated locomotives in America, let's talk about some of the... odder decisions. The Chesapeake and Ohio Class M1. Hey there, CNO! How you doing, guys? And what in the world have you brought me today? No, seriously, what is that? What? What? What is that? Why? What? Is that a diesel? No, no, it is not. Do not ever say that to me again, because that's not what that is. This was CNO's attempt at a steam turbine locomotive constructed for them by Baldwin between 1947 and 1948. They actually produced three of the blasted things, and they were designed to run off coal. At the time, dieselization was in full swing across most of America, but CNO was reluctant to abandon coal as a fuel source. They wanted an alternative, so that they could still use coal, but still be forward-thinking, and steam turbines at the time seemed like a worthwhile endeavor. Locomotives each contained a single Westinghouse turbine that drove four direct current generators, which were mounted in pairs. Those generators produced about 1,000 kilowatts each, that's 1,300 horsepower, and those four generators turned eight traction motors in total. However, they didn't work so well. These turbines, for one thing, were actually mechanically unreliable, and, as I mentioned before, when I've talked about steam turbines, they just weren't economical. At high speeds, they're great, but at low speeds, they're awful. They use way more fuel than pretty much anything else you could possibly be using. And not a single one of them was preserved. They were scrapped in 1950. But, they still were very, very heavy. Very heavy. These things weighed in at 617 tons absurdly heavy, and their generators could actually produce nearly 5,000 horsepower. It's a shame that steam turbines overall just never seemed to work that well, no matter who gave them a try. The Virginian Railway EL-3A. This locomotive type has done its best to annoy the heck out of me from a research perspective, because I don't know what it is, but there just isn't much information on it, and a lot of it is dubious at best. But the few sources I've been able to find about it have concurred on a handful of points. For one thing at the time, they were huge, constructed in 1925. And despite being considered a single locomotive, they were obviously in three segmented parts. This has bumped up their weight quite a bit, but more on that in a second. They were built by Alco and Westinghouse, working together, and they were meant as coal drag power used until the mid-50s. It seems they were all scrapped, no longer exist, which is sad, but... Well, we're talking about weight here, and yo, why on earth does an electric locomotive have to be this heavy? This thing weighed 624 metric tons. It could produce 277,500 pounds of force, and had a continuous horsepower rating of 6,000 in 1925. What the heck, Virginian? Did you need that? Are you sure? I mean, I guess, they used them, and they seem to have worked, based on what I can tell. The Union Pacific GTEL's Coal Burner. Now, this requires some clarification. Because some of the more well-versed in history are probably like, No, 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 you're wrong, Darkness. You're wrong. I know you're wrong, because I'm smarter than you. Let me leave a mean YouTube comment about it. This is the reason why no one watches your videos, and your views are down, you hack! Well, first of all, you can let me finish, and second of all, wow, that hurts. But, more to the point, the GTELs were gas turbine electric locomotives built by Alco and General Electric between 1952 and 1961. 
They were operated by Union Pacific between 1952 and 1970, which is really impressive for a gas turbine, or turbines in general. On the railways, they usually don't last that long. But the GTELs did all right for the most part. They weren't perfect, but Union Pacific got plenty of use out of them due to their longer lines. The turbines could operate at higher speeds for longer, therefore making it so that the fuel efficiency at lower speeds never really caused that much of a problem. They were actually supplied in three generations, with the third seemingly the best one. But the generations are kind of irrelevant to this discussion because none of them were heavier than the big boy. Union Pacific tried an experiment, constructing a GTEL of their own in October of 1962. They used a modified Alco PA-1 as the cab for this thing, as well as the chassis of a GNW-1 class electric locomotive, which they bought for scrap from the Great Northern Railway, and a modified turbine prime mover that was taken from either a first generation or second generation GTEL, though no one's sure exactly which one it would have been. This wound up with a wheel arrangement that consisted of A1A-A1A plus 2-D plus D-2, which was really fun for me to say, and you're welcome by the way. And for those who need a translation, that's 18 axles, of which 12 were powered. They retained the PA-1's 2,000 horsepower diesel engine, and the B unit carried the main power plant for the main generators, which contributed 5,000 horsepower, for a total power output of 7,000 horsepower. And like I said, this was meant to run on coal. They wanted to use coal to power the turbine to see if it'd be better than gas. They used the tender from a Challenger steam locomotive, number 3990. The setup itself was numbered 80, but they changed it to 8080 later to avoid conflict with new EMD DD35s that were being introduced. But it didn't work well at all. The blade erosion and soot buildup that had already been kind of an issue with the earlier gas turbines was way worse when they were using coal. On top of that, even the effort of grinding coal into fine particles, specifically to avoid as much erosion as possible, was kind of a pain. The experiment was declared a failure, and it was scrapped after spending only 20 months in service. But during that time, it would have been what I believe would be the heaviest locomotive ever. How much weight was behind the 7,000 horsepower we just brought up? Oh, you know, just 661 metric tons. What? Yo, that's absurd. For those who don't speak tons, that's nearly a million five hundred thousand pounds, or just over 660,000 kilograms. This thing was heavy. It was also 215 feet long. It didn't work, though, because coal dust isn't nice to turbines, apparently. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267 Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Captain Von Thrust the Third, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian Pretzer, Twin Fox, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Major Klutz, and Ty Hammonds Jr. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual Vaughn, farewell.